a check-in interview with Niels Backman on why it has proven to be so difficult to get his RSA, Regenerative Seawater Agriculture Project, funded. It's proven by his partners 20 years ago in Eritrea. All the puzzle pieces seem to be there. The shrimp market is ready to be disrupted. The mangroves are being planted and growing. The land is dirt cheap. The genetics are there. Solar energy and pump technology have become way cheaper. The local Mexican communities are on board and actually invited them to develop the project there. But somehow investors are not jumping on top of it. And from an investor point of view, that's actually very understandable. So we set out to unpack that specific point and to see what Neil has learned over the last six months of brutal, painful pitching and hearing no over and over again, and how he reckons he's going to change that and get this project funded and bring it to life at scale in the real world. If it's true that water vapor accounts for 60 to 70% of the greenhouse effect, while well, CO2 only accounts for 25, why do we rarely discuss it? Maybe we choose to ignore it because it means we literally need to revegetate the entire earth. Bring back the marshes, the mangroves, the perennial pastures with trees and regrow real forests that can bring back rain in strategic places. In short, bring back life, lots of plants, trees, animals back to many places on this earth, natural climate engineering. It is time we take our role as keystone species super seriously. In this special water cycle series, we interview the dreamers and the doers who are using the latest technology to figure out where to intervene first. They're making or trying to make the investment and return calculations and plans. So what's missing? What's holding us back? Maybe we lack the imagination to back them and try regeneration at scale. We're thankful for the support of the Nest family office in order to make this series. The Nest is a family office dedicated to building a more resilient food system through supporting natural solutions and innovative technologies that change the way we produce food. You can find out more on the Nest FO, that is nestfo.com. Welcome to another episode. Today we have Neil Speckman back on the show. Um, we had him in on here in August last year. It depends when you're listening to this, obviously, but it was 2022. Uh, we're now at, uh, let's say, half of 2023. And we have him back to talk about the finance piece. Of course, we also talked about it last time, but there has been developments, some lessons learned, and a lot of uh, interesting things, I think, to share with this community of why investing in uh, decorated uh, coastal lands and specifically on restoring the water cycle has been so tricky. So what's been missing and what can we do about it and how should we move forward? So Neil, uh, thank you very much for coming on again and welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Con. And so obviously I will link below the previous interview we did and, and there of your work in, um, in, in Saudi Arabia and, and also the ones you're building or what you're building currently in Mexico. So let's give a bit of an update on the Mexico piece. Uh, where are you at? Because I think last time, um, I don't think there was a, a working prototype yet or a minimum viable product. And mm -hmm. so we're talking now May, end of May, beginning of June. Uh, 2023, what is happening on the ground, in the ground, in the air, let's say, in Mexico as we speak? Yeah. So we have, um, since you and I last spoke, we have uh, begun a mangrove restoration project in earnest, um, or rather not begun, but we're actually in the, the restoration phase rather than the pre-development phase. And that happened primarily through a grant um, and what we hope will be a partnership with One Tree Planted. Uh, One Tree Planted is a nonprofit that uh, essentially harvests uh, CSR funds from, from corporations and, and plows them into restoration and reforestation projects. Um, and so very, very happy that that worked out um, and that our team on the ground is growing things. And there's, they've been learning a lot. Our, our project manager there is a local guy who's been working with mangroves for 15 years in the area. So he's, he's kind of the embodiment of indigenous mangrove knowledge. Um, but he's, he's come up with some really innovative things just in terms of logistics and sorting out 
you know, the viability of, of seeds so that um, initially we thought we were going to have an 87% success rate in terms of survivability. And instead, because he's got this new sorting method, it's up to 97, 98%, which is really... And what was 87 based on? Like previous experience with mangroves? Previous mangrove, experience. Or... Yeah. Um, so they're learning on the ground and that's informing all sorts of things that, that we're doing elsewhere. Um, and that's, that's really encouraging. We, we're uh, honored to have the trust of a couple fishing villages in this region, honored to have them working with us and really happy that that's ongoing. The carbon piece of that is tricky mm -hmm. um, because Why? It's, on, it's on federal land and there's not a clear policy directive on how Mexico treats carbon crediting on federal land. Um, and there's some uh, high turnover rate among some of the officials that, that we wish we were working with more closely. So that's We'll get there eventually. Mexico has done concessions for carbon crediting on federal land before, and that's likely what we're going to do. But in the meantime, you know, there's a multi-year statute of limitations on the carbon, so we're happily growing trees now, and we've done about half a million of them so far this year. Just un under wow. half a million, but almost that much. Um, and so how does that connect into a broader system or, or let's say yeah. the mangrove piece, how does it connect to, to further on land? And of course, you already mentioned the fisher villages, but further, let's say, into, uh, in, into the sea. So this is, this is a kind of a case study, but these fishing villages live in, on a lagoon that's a UNESCO biosphere. And it's, it's a place where the Pacific gray whale comes to calve every year. So you get, you get baby whales born in this lagoon every January and February. And, and whale tourism is a big part of the economy here, right? But it only lasts for two months out of the year. The rest of the year, most people are fishing. And we understand from our partners that in the 1980s, there were like, 10 fishing teams here and now there are 650 and their catch has reportedly decreased by about 90 percent over the last 10-15 years which is uh it puts the them total in catch not the catch per boat yeah yeah the team. total yeah. catch is down wow. about 90 percent and so they're facing a pretty dire situation and it's in a, a super sensitive area ecologically because of the whales. Um, and so it's, it's a high visibility, high, um, you know, lynch point, I guess. It's, it's a focal point of, of the health of the whole Pacific Ocean in, in a way because of this keystone species that has babies here. And so we started, we were invited up to meet some of these villagers back in 2020 um, and started getting to know them, started to get to know the situation, started to build trust um, and uh, eventually decided that we were going to try to do a full, a full on program here. In our town hall meetings and getting to know these folks, um, we realized that they had identified all sorts of solutions to their problems, but they didn't have access to capital, whether financial or political. Um, they didn't have know-how on project execution. They, they, there was, but they had identified solutions. They just didn't have a way to implement them. And so they asked us if we would help them with a mangrove restoration project. As, as kind of a first go of things. And, and if you had asked me three years ago if we were going to be doing restoration, I would have said no, um, that it was, it was outside of the purview of what we wanted to do. But because of this area and because they asked us to, we, we thought we'd take it on. Um, blue carbon was always a part of our business model. And so this was kind of like a horizontal expansion into more blue carbon. But what we realized pretty quickly 
And, and what we've realized since, as we've worked on other projects, consulted on some and led a couple, um, is that the, the key to durability in nature-based carbon credits is a sustainable economy, right? And when, when people criticize, you know, forest-based carbon or when they express distrust in it, it's, you know, how do you keep people from cutting it down? How do you know a forest fire is not going to happen? How do you, right? There's, there's this sense that it's temporal. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer to that is, well, it, it doesn't make any sense to grow trees unless you address why people are cutting them down in the first place. Right. And so that in this means, case, it doesn't make any sense to grow mangroves if we don't if, consider if, why they have disappeared in the first place. Yeah. And so in this particular area, the people asked us to support a mangrove restoration project. And it's grown since then into a full on program where through our RSA system, we can build that sustainable. What is RSA model. just for the people that didn't listen to the other one? Yeah, RSA is regenerative seawater agriculture. It is a, um, as far as I can tell, it is the first regenerative onshore aquaculture system that integrates um, intensive aquacultures with mangrove agroforestry and halophytic agricultures. Which means saltwater based, right? Yeah. Which means saltwater yeah. based. So there are crops that will grow in seawater. Um, and when we combine that seawater ag with aquaculture, it solves multiple problems by combining those systems. And, and so, so this we, mangrove project started with basically community inviting you, okay, let's do a restoration project. You yes. like, okay, maybe that fits, maybe that doesn't, but we, we like the community and yeah. we like the question, let's do it. Okay. We find some funding through uh, basically an offsetting uh, mechanism or CSR um, uh, project. And then it like sort of pivoted, not pivoted, but evolved into um, also the the aquaculture and agriculture piece. Was it a very logical, like what, did they present their list of things in the community? I mean, saying, okay, mangrove first, and then we would like to tackle because you said they have a whole host of, of yeah. solutions to their problems. Was it a very yeah. logical step too? It, very much so. I mean, we were invited there initially to assess it for RSA. Ah, okay. That was the initial invitation. Is someone, someone local heard about the work we were doing in La Paz, which is a, a four or five hour drive south. And he said, we've got so much barren coastal land. Will you come up here and see if you could do it where we are? Right. That was that was the initial invitation. Um, but the, the full program now is um, mangrove and seagrass restoration. Mm -hmm. um, with blue carbon crediting eventually, plus RSA, there's there's tens of thousands of hectares of applicable land for RSA, which which is on it tricky itself, to do it on on federal land. There is it tricky to to do that, or it's relatively easy. Or there's what's federal that and private land in the area, okay. and we could do either. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's it's more it's a more sensitive area because of its status as a whale UNESCO. sanctuary yeah. and a unesco biosphere and that's led to some of the um that's partly why we're doing the restoration first because the the folks who are in charge of the environmental ministries have said well we get the idea for rsa but we want to see it somewhere else before we approve it here Mm -hmm. Right. Because we we've said it's a non polluting system, but they want to see that. Right. Fair we, enough. Yeah, they've they've know, heard that before. And I, and we get that. Yeah. We yeah. get that. Yeah. Um, so they just like half a million mangroves. Like how what's the size of an area you plant that just have an idea for people to imagine? It's not that big. You're, you're doing uh, between four and six thousand mangroves per hectare. OK, so it's that's so it's around 100 hectares that we've done yeah. so far this year. Yeah. And with plans to continue that. Yes. Basically, yeah, left there's, and right. There's, yeah. The full mangrove project is uh, over 2000 hectares. And then 
we, we've got to validate this next number, but we're estimating 6,000 hectares of seagrass restoration. Um, and we have a couple collaborators who are expert in that, who are working with us. Um, but in the end, what we hope to do is do the restoration, build a big enough RSA system that we can give all the fishermen jobs, right? In and the off say, season, basically, when they're not yeah. working on the, the, the whale tourism. Yeah. yeah. And then and then what that would allow us to do is to put the fishery into rest, right? If everyone's got a job, they've all got income and they're working in this circular economy system, right? That's not damaging the ocean. It's not damaging the coastline. Um, then that allows us to put the fishery into rest for the fishery to, to be rehabilitated. And then however long that takes, you can then implement yeah. management of that in a sustainable way. Any idea how long that would take? I, that I know, that's, number that's of years science that, beyond I mean, what i know but it's it's years probably but not a, not a few decades i think that the ocean has proved especially with res restored mangrove nearby that it's yeah. it's surprisingly quick it's not days yeah. obviously but it's also not a hundred years like it's, it's i mean a, we you'd have eight thousand hectares of restored coastal ecosystem being carried out by local folks so that's jobs that have that's been created already, already. Yeah. But it's also a way to create a sense of stewardship, right? Because the local folks are the ones who are doing it. Uh, so there's there's a there's a cultural piece to that, and, and a you know building a strong connection to the land through the restoration work. Now that to some degree that already exists, right? Yeah. And in fact, it was um, I'd show you a picture, but there's a a lady that we met named Abuelita Marta. Um, Abuelita Marta has been a professional fisher for 35 years in this area. And in, in our interviews with the local people and getting to know things, one of the questions we asked was, is there a future for fishing in this region? Like, are your children and your grandchildren going to be able to fish here? And she was the only one who said yes. Wow. Right. Out of, out of 25, 30 people that we interviewed one on one, you know, over over a two year period, she's the one who said yes. And we were like, oh, really? Well, how how <laughs> how is that? And she said the the word she used is cuidando. Um, she she essentially said, look, we need to steward the ocean and we need to be able to rest it. And if we take care of the mangroves and we can rest the ocean then our kids can fish here indefinitely, right? Like she, if I had brought up the concept of, you know, the tragedy of the commons, you know, she probably wouldn't have known what that was because, you know, she's had some years of schooling, but I don't think she has a high school degree. But she already knew it. She was like, look, if we take care of it, it's going to take care of us. Of course. And she's that. 100% right, right? And she, mm -hmm. so she's the one who said, hey, let's put it into rest. And that was when the light bulb clicked for us. And we we're like, aha, well, RSA is how we can do that. And, and how many, then the other side of the coin is how many jobs do you need or how big does the system have to be to provide those jobs? Yeah, and it's, it's in the thousands of hectares. It's in the thousands. For the RSA system, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, it, but it's doable. That, that is a, so in and the end. And it's modular, right? It's not that you have to, it's not a massive... Um, new airport you're building that it has to be in one shot in, no, in no, no, like, or no. a massive new harbor or some kind of infrastructure thing that people no, it would imagine. All be no, saved. it's piece by piece. Yeah. But in the end, so we, are, we, we see ourselves being involved here for the next 20 years. But in the end, what we'll have is thousands of hectares of restored coastal ecosystems, you know, with I don't know how many tons of carbon credits. You know, at we'll least figure that out along the way, if, yeah. not, if not into the millions. Um, a circular regenerative economy that, that can grow with the population if the population is growing, right? That doesn't pollute, that increases biodiversity and generates blue carbon on its own. A rehabilitated fishery that can then be managed sustainably 
and a marine protected area for the whales. And, and this way it, it can be maintained as a whale sanctuary indefinitely because the, the economic causes of degradation, won't that won't be a threat anymore. And so what, like this intersection of coastal area degraded and, and massive opportunities, have you seen the conversation change since let's say the summer uh, since we we spoke about in terms of interest, because then we're going to get to the financial piece. Uh, yeah. Why is it so difficult or what's holding it back? Has that conversation changed in the pre conversation? You said, I'm doing a lot of education. Um, yeah. Has there been more, more significant, more interest in because of blue carbon, which is starting to get uh, maybe a bit more uh, into the spotlight or has it been still really focused on, on only trees and some other things? Like, have you seen a shift in conversation over the last eight months or so, or or not really, not yet. Um, I think we've we're shifting the conversation in response to feedback we've gotten from pitching over the last six months, um, and it's been it's I've learned a great deal doing this process. Please um, share. And so I mean, we started with this. There's so. That project is called Delgadito, the one I just talked about mm -hmm. for 10 minutes. And that's kind of a case study of how we want to work is the being invited, be, well, really being go deep invited, in interviewing, yeah. putting indigenous people up front and make and maximizing local expertise and, and local knowledge. But then also the, the explicit recognition that conservation if it's going to last, needs sustainable economies, and we want to approach those things together, right? That we can build a circular regenerative economy, and that opens up space for restoration of coastal ecosystems. Like that's that's kind of how we want to deploy our system, where that's an opportunity to do so. Um, and so what we started out with four years ago was uh, we started in Mexico, in Baja, and uh, did a lot of different site visits. Um, started figuring out, you know, who could be on our team down here. Who who are the people that we want to to help spearhead this and lead us lead it with us? And we've we've since found some amazing people. We identified some sites. Um, and then we we ended up in this kind of catch-22 or this chicken and egg problem where we're like, okay, well, we can't get a funder unless we have a project, right? A project needs permits, land, a business model, a financial model, and a team, right? Which all required money, which is why which, you need Which all yeah. required money, right, to put that together. We now have the team we have some permits and a promise of expedited permits. We have sites identified where we have negotiated the right to purchase the land. Um, and we've got an amazing team of folks. I mean, we've got over 200 years of collective experience in the aquaculture world, um, po environmental policy, um, mm -hmm. from, 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 you know, soup to nuts on that industry with a focus on shrimp and bivalves, right? So we've we've got all that. And it took us years to put it together. Um, and we were only able to do that because we did get an angel investor uh, back in 2020. Family office basically backing you, yeah. Mm. Right, so we put all that together. And my assumption was, if we get all this together, we're gonna be able to fund the project because that's the missing piece, right? We've got the land, we've got the team, we've got the business model, we've got the financial models, we've got offtake agreements, um, we've got really amazing markets we're operating in. And what the last six months has taught me is that that wasn't true, right? Even though we put it all together, I've had a devil of a time financing these projects. And some of this has been um, due to the fact that we didn't have a functioning MVP, mm -hmm. um, we did do this. I say we, I was not part of this, yeah. but my partners did do this at a commercial scale in East Africa 20 mm -hmm. years ago. Right. And that was, and but still, yeah, and so are... 
they had 400 employees. They were exporting multiple tons of seafoods a year, a month to, uh, to the EU markets. They were providing fodder for um, local camel herders. They were profitable. Um, and I was like, well, okay, we've got this, but we don't have anything running right now. Where uh, you can bring people. I think right. gonna, you so don't that, have a place where you can say, come and visit us in Baja yep. or come and visit and, us in XYZ and so just see it. A, yes, it's small and it's going to be much bigger, but this is a thing you can touch, you can smell, you can yeah. taste, you can. So that was a major stumbling block. Um, which which we have now remedied. We do essentially have a system running in when a you garage. Say essentially, what's missing? It, <laughs> it's essentially running, meaning so small. Yeah, yeah. I, we're it's like still. Bill Gates building the computer in his garage. Okay, we have a system running in a garage. We're growing fish. We're growing salicornia. We're growing algae, and we're growing mangroves. Right. So it's there. It's running. It's operating. And this is still financed by the angel investor or how did you manage to, to get, because also for him or her or for them, no, this we, is getting interesting, of course, because they, they find, they want to sort of yeah. unlock this to project phase. And, and that's, that's where the struggle is. You know, that, that MVP was funded by revenues we got from doing design consultancies. So the, so we've kept the lights on by doing some design yeah. jobs over the last 18 months. Um, and now Which as you have, have it, do you see a difference in like a difference in conversation that you can say, come and visit and see, like come and visit the garage or, we, or has that changed something? No one's yet? come to yet. see it yet. You're okay. actually the first person externally I've told that we have this working. I'm honored to have the, 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 so, the, so the announcement is here. We've got, we've got a tiny, tiny RSA system functioning in a garage. So anybody uh, listening, if you're interested, and this was your point of, of not wanting to go deeper into DD, etc., um, go to Mexico and go and see it. Yeah. So we will, we will be, um, displaying that later this summer. Super. Um, so that's, that was one that's major a big lesson block. learned. Yeah. Another major stumbling block has been, you know, fairly typical where We've had a lot of people say, yeah, I'm really interested, but uh, get back in touch when you've got more traction. Or we don't want to be first, but we are very interested. Uh, and those folks may come along later on or they may not. But, you know, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think the complexity of a circular system to, to someone that isn't a systems thinker or someone who's used to investing in, you know, incremental changes in a given market. It's um, difficult to imagine to see like a piece of th incredibly degraded coastline and go like, okay, this could be a, a, what yeah. is it, a 180 this, difference. And it's just. Th this isn't an incremental change to a, to a, you to know, one, a given yeah. technology or to a given market. This is an entire system, right? It is a new regenerative coastal seawater agriculture. Um, and so. And in many cases, it maybe sounds almost too good to be true, which makes investors I did very, hear that very from hesitant. A couple people. I did hear that from a couple of people. I, I don't feel like it's too good to be true. I feel like yeah, it's but you're in your, in your, you're in it, of course. That's different. Yeah, I'm in it. Um, but the complexity of it, I think the complexity scares people. Uh, because typically we assume that complexity adds risk, which is true when it comes to operational complexity. But when we're, looking at, <laughs> when we're looking at regenerative ag, the standard model is yeah. stacking enterprises on a given land base that form, that have synchronicity and have um, certain factors where they, they actually bring risk down overall right and but so maybe then in a case it's almost to when you pitch to i don't know i'm not saying dumb it down but make it less complex in the pitch at least like i've heard yeah. people definitely pitch things way more um linear than they are in reality maybe just in this case the shrimp part or just the bible sure. or something and then the other things are 
byproducts that make it possible, but not necessarily the, the main focus of the story. Because otherwise, if you start adding three, four things, yeah, people just get very confused very quickly because they're used, as you say, to yep. a lot of boxes. And, and unless you have the time and the luxury to educate everybody and take them on an 18 month journey, um, yeah, you, you might get into a lot of uh, long conversations and, and people trying to wrap their head around instead of just saying we're, we're growing shrimp in the most sustainable way possible. And, and, and oh, there are also bivalves, which just add to the margins, which are just really good, yeah. but they're may, may, mainly just the filters. Well, but and, let and, me, let me give you an example though, right? Cause we've got, take a standard shrimp farm, right? Where they're, they're dumping their wastewater in the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, that aside from creating dead zones, in the ocean and being highly polluting. What that what they're doing is they're polluting their own water source, mm -hmm. right? And so if if you pollute your own source of water, eventually you're introducing disease vectors. You're increasing the need for the use of antibiotics. You're increasing the risk of die-offs and losing your crop in a given cycle, which happens all the time. Yeah. Which happens all the time. Right? So maybe that's the, the story. Like, look, this is how so it's done now. The, this the is the standard, alternative. The standard way of doing this has all sorts of risk built into it, aside from the ecological degradation, right? Our system doesn't have any of that, so our costs will be lower. We don't ever have to use antibiotics. Our risks of disease are a lot lower, partially because we've got super clean water, but we're not polluting our own source. Um, but then you take things like uh, hurricanes. Baja, Mexico is directly in the path of hurricanes. And in fact, the communities we're working with, these fishing villages, got hit by a hurricane in September. If you just have a shrimp farm that's a standard model along this coast, and it gets hit end. by a hurricane, you've got serious damages. If you surround it with mangroves, which is what we're doing, the damages are going to be a lot lower. So, the, so by combining this mangrove agroforestry with shrimp, we have lower hurricane risk, lower operational costs, lower risk of disease vectors. But that's because of the complexity of combining the two yeah, systems. Uh, so in my head, I'm like, nobody... oh, we're bringing risk down by combining all this stuff. I know, but the weird thing is that for people, risk is also like, especially if they're not investing their money. So if they're institutional capital, like, yeah. nobody's going to get fired for investing in a corn soy uh, rotation in, in the Midwest or a standard shrimp farm that maybe has some sustainability um, sure. measurements, et cetera, et cetera, because everybody else is doing it as well. And so there's, there's this interesting dynamic that it's almost less risky for the person to do this compared in their peers, in their institution, or even if, if it's their own money compared, of course, it's riskier to lose the money, but it's not riskier like in their, um, in their, in their system. And that's the weird uh, dynamic here in when you introduce new things. So I was wondering, is there things to, are there things to learn from, let's say the early people in the renewable energy space where they also needed permits, they needed offtake agreements, they needed new technology that nobody really knew like how long the spreadsheets would, would work. Yeah. Um, and, and somehow, of course, they, it took an enormous amount of time, but we unlocked that, that industry. And I don't know if there are lessons learned. If you talk to anybody that has sort of, when you speak, they say, oh, we were there 20 years ago. Yeah, it was really difficult. Wind on land in blah, blah, blah. And now it took time, but we, we managed with these and these um, pitches also because I remember the first, I think SLM partners, when I talked to Tony Lovell for the first time in, in Australia on regenerative grazing, and I asked, why didn't you mention carbon in your pitch decks? Because he was pitching to Danish pension funds. This was 2011. Yeah. And he said, because I want to be taken seriously. And yeah. so I don't know where, and he, he wasn't not doing it. He was definitely, and they're still, they're getting interesting payments in, in Australia because the market has come along, et cetera. But he just chose to not mention it because it would add this, this level of complexity and the Danish pension fund yep. invested because they also invested in other, um, so maybe that's the route. He invest, they also invested in other grazing operations and they invested in Tony because it was sort of a hatch. They thought if drought hits, at least Tony will be able to harvest and our others will suffer a lot. Yep. And so I don't know what the angle is. I will come back to the question, like, are you, learning from like other pioneering sectors that are 20 year further, like the renewable energy space, or maybe some other places to, to frame it or to talk about it differently or, 
who to talk to, like wh what have you done that really? there over the last six months? We're getting better and better leads. Um, I think, I do think, I mean, you're suggesting that the right thing to do is dumb it down, right? And I don't and, know. I don't, I really don't know. It depends on the audience. That as well. I'm not, I'm not saying dumb it down. I'm, I'm saying it depends who you talk to. If you talk to a big pension fund that somebody internally has to really stick their neck out to make this work, it's different than if you talk to a family office that if they click and get on board and understand the complexity, yeah. they could yeah, be yeah, partners yeah. for 20 years. There's a different... Because so we, in the pension fund, they might change job primarily tomorrow. Primarily family offices, mm -hmm. but we're getting a little bit into you know private equity with an ocean focus. There's some mm -hmm. of that as well, um, which is not really meant for projects, right? It's more meant for you to be it, able it, to do I more projects. I mean, if if we have to do an equity raise to to build our first farm, I'd it. be fine yeah. with that, right? Because yeah. the 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 pathway for new food systems. So some of the folks I have talked with are pioneers of other kind of, we've got this new food system. How does it go from being a concept to actually being an industry? And, and they say, look, you always start with the prototype, then you build your first farm, then you build your IP and your technology around it, and then you scale, right? So we're at the build your prototype. first farm yeah. phase. And build your first farm. Yeah. If someone wants to get to buy equity in the company to fund that piece of it, you know, the first farm and the IP and, and all the tech, we'd be fine with that. That'd be great. Um, and, and it may end up being that way. Because that's riskier uh, capital. That's uh, like they, they take a risk with you and, yeah. and, but enable you to build out that first farm. Yeah. Um, the, see, and, and the way, I've had to get out of my own head communicating this because to me, the the whole concept that in circular systems complexity can reduce risk is so counterintuitive, and I did I mean, not. It's great for a key. That. It's great for like a keynote speech at a at a conference on that, but maybe not. For yeah, a pitch. yeah, one day I'll give a TED a TED talk on that. But when I'm pitching people, I've learned that it, it's too scary, yeah. even though that's where the comparative advantage is. That's where we're going to outcompete the industry. Um, and that's where the, the gains and profits are. Like shrimp farming is profitable today as long as, you, as long as you're vertically integrated enough and capture enough of the value chain and as long as you've got access to good markets. And our, our people have that. We have a distributor um, who's already signed an offtake agreement with us. We've, in our financial model, we've assumed that we'll just be buying conventional feed for the first six years. It's still profitable. Um, but then you dial in our own feed. You dial in, okay, we don't have to pay for the antibiotics costs. We don't have to assume that we're going to lose the crop every three years. We don't have to pay for cleansing the system Right, like you do with a, a recirculating with bleach, yeah. Right, we don't have to <laughs> do any of that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Then you take all those costs out, and we're like, well, we're going to blow the industry out of the water with this. But uh, then it sounds too good to be true, and then people. Are and like, then Ooh. it sounds too good to be true, but when you that's how maybe you have to dumb down the returns. Systems out compete, right? They get a little yeah, yeah, bit no, of no. premium in the market, but they reduce costs significantly. Right. No, that's, that's what I remember from from Tony and literally this on regenerative grazing. Yeah, like they were advisors for many people making the switch and the transition in the in in Australia, and they saw carrying capacity going up, cost dramatically going down, and people yeah. suddenly had extra time. Like people started solar businesses on the side. They they uh, yeah. put up. They they cleaned their houses. They they redid that while their neighbors were going bankrupt and. Like yeah. that dynamic was just fascinating to see, and that's why they raised the fund to do it at much larger scale because. There are a few of those niches now and, and probably more where yeah, the, the cost drop is just so significant that even if you don't have enormous markets ready to pay premiums and the organic certification, et cetera, et cetera, you still, still make it work because the yep. cost starts. It's not just that you make it work. It's more profitable than the industry standard. Yeah. And because, more stable. Yeah. And, and less risky. Less volatile is the word that volatile. investors like to and more investors resilient. like to hear. Right. Yeah. And so I've been less in correlated the regenerative with the market world risk. for yeah. 
Yeah. You know, I've been in this world for 15 years and that's a concept that I've like internalized. Like I understand better profitability comes from lower costs that come through circular systems that are working with ecosystem function, right? That's, that's the bottom line of why regenerative systems are more profitable. And that's been borne out across so, multiple industries. Yeah. But my potential investors haven't internalized that. And so I'm making mistakes the way I'm communicating this. And so what would be your main lesson then to others that are in similar um, situations like over the last painful six months? Uh, because these conversations pitching is is brutal and painful. Yeah. Um, especially when you hear no or like maybe yeses, but people are like, you get this look of, I don't really understand or I don't really believe it. What's yeah. your what's your biggest lesson learned, let's say for the industry, not saying the financial industry, the practitioner industry that's listening? I mean, I, I, I think I'll have a better answer to that question after we get to a yes. And we build our first plan. But I'm in the process now, like what's yeah, your, I'm, I'm, your, I'm your, mid, your midterm learned? And yeah. you're always, you've always got a better view looking back or when you're outside looking in rather than inside looking around. But I do think, um, I do think that I've, I've learned to speak the language better. You know, I've, I've, I've learned to focus on a particular niche. Like, I mean, we've pitched institutionals, we've pitched family offices, we've pitched angel networks, we've pitched, you know, some of the, some of the more um, impact oriented, larger funds. And in that process, I figured out, oh, we really just need to be talking to family offices because we're asking for more than an angel is going to be willing to put in. But we're mm -hmm. not to the point that an institutional is going to be like, oh, yeah, we want in on this because they're going to want to see a functioning system first. Mm -hmm. So I, I have learned to, you know, and there may be exceptions to that, right? There may be, you know, some unique folks. Yeah, but you need to focus somewhere. Otherwise, yeah, just you're going to waste an enormous amount of time talking yep. to pension yep. funds and they might take the call because they're interested, but then you're mostly on an educational tour, not necessarily on a fundraising tour. But they, they say experience is the hardest teacher because they give you the test first and then the lesson. Absolutely. And that, that's been and the so last six months. The planning is always difficult, but like you're saying after summer, uh, we have this, this prototype, let's say more open for um, investors and the public, like what, what's the, what does the next four or five, six months look like? Ideally, of course, it's very difficult to predict, but what, um, yeah. what do you see happening over the, let's say the, the Northern hemisphere summer as we're going into that? So we may, I think we'll get the concession for the carbon on our mm -hmm. restoration project. And we'll probably the blue one or the tree one, like the, which, the, which carbon are we? the restoration. Okay. Okay. Not the agroforestry, the restoration. Okay. And we may, we may pre-sell some credits or sell some of the first credits off of that um, just to get some revenues in. And then for the folks who are looking at a typical valuation of, of like, well, what are your revenues? Then we have some that we can point to and that'll bring our valuation up. Um, but other than that, I think we, we are going to fund this first farm. Uh, in Baja, basically. We'll, yeah. yeah, in Baja. We'll get some production going. We Again, we already have the offtake. So we've had people asking us, like, when, when can you deliver? Yeah. <laughs> Which is a funny place to be in. Uh, and uh, then we've got to build that farm, grow it, and then build the IP around it. And there's, there's a lot of IP in this, actually, from uh, some of which will be trade secrets and some of which will be patents. Um, but in particular, I'm really excited about our aquaculture feed. Ah, because you said the first six years were in our models were um, planning or we, we are writing to, to buy it. But I, yeah. I, I was already assuming that wouldn't be the case. So talk about, talk about the feed, because in aquaculture, I'm not sure in shrimp, but in general, that's sort of the biggest linchpin. Um, so what, what are you excited about? Sixty-five percent of the operating cost is feed. Yeah. Um, but also the feed is really, it's very damaging, right? Typically feed is one third corn, 
or wheat paste, one third soy protein, and one third bycatch. Right. So all three amazing uh, ecosystem all, building yeah, exactly. <laughs> ingredients. Yeah. Um, if you can imagine, shrimp don't eat corn and soybeans in the wild. Ah, really? They don't forage? Yeah, it's, I mean, you wouldn't. I'm a sh- uh, I mean, shock. Well, that's, that's probably the first shock in all your pitches. Like you start the first slide. <laughs> shrimp don't eat corn. Um, okay, so, but then it's a very subsidized crop. Both of them are, and yep. so cheap and, yep. and very easy to get to because everybody's doing it. Yep. So how do you get around um, that? And then the, I'll assume our audience knows about bycatch. Yes, uh, but just let's assume we, we haven't done too many and I get criticized for that. Some people are listening now. Um, <laughs> things on the ocean and, and with aquaculture. Okay. And so we might do more on that. Um, who's listening knows who I'm talking to. Um, but bycatch is basically if you're, especially with larger nets and larger operations, you catch a lot of things that, that you don't you're not actually necessarily want. selling. That you don't actually want. It's not very selective. It's like going with a massive net through the forest uh, and, and trying to... What, what is like trying to get some insects and also catch an elephant every now and then. That's like it's right. the percentages are insane. The destruction yeah. is insane. Most of it goes overboard immediately. I think in Europe now you have to bring it uh, on land, which is interesting. How you check that is a second. Yeah. Um, but there is some industry using that at least, which is sort of the least thing you can do. But yeah, I think in many, many boats, feed. it's more than half. Yeah. It's all going so to it's grinded. Feed, but it's, it's, I mean, we're raping the oceans doing it. Basically. Um, so. That's that's so, a nice trio to replace, yeah. Yeah, so we have... Uh, so one of the things we're growing right now is algae. Algae mm-hmm. is already a known aquaculture feed. One of the things we produce in the seawater ag is a, a very high-quality protein seed that we press for the oil, and then we get the seed cake. There's high-quality protein there. But the other thing we have is mangrove leaves. Um, which is actually what shrimp eat in the wild, right? Where we so know like how to fodder. grow a mangrove agroforestry where we're producing, you know, around, around eight tons of mangrove leaves per hectare per year. Uh, and that's a coppice system. Okay. Right? We're, we're coppicing mangroves. And mm-hmm. we've done this before. I don't know of anybody else that ever has. So just to be your, your, you're coppicing, meaning you harvest without damaging, actually improving the growth rate of the tree. It, it extends the life of the tree, but you're harvesting yeah. most of the above ground biomass on a circular, on a cyclical basis, right? And so, uh, so, so it's a very interesting symbiotic relationship between the keystone species or the super keystone species, the human and yeah. the mangrove tree. Yeah. And the mangrove, right? But in, in the wild, shrimp hatch in mangrove wetlands. Right. And one of the first things they eat (laughs) are mangrove leaves. So they must be good. And so we know how to grow mangroves in a farm setting. We know how to coppice them. We know how to harvest those leaves. And there's some proprietary aspects to what we do with them before they go into our aquaculture feed. Yeah, you just don't don't throw the leaves straight into the tank. I can't. No. No. Um, There's some. But that's a very interesting source, of course. And so how. I, but that also seems, and I, I immediately put my investor hat on, like the complexity yeah. just adds on. Like, okay, or I buy feed. Okay, it's destructive, but let's close our eyes for that for a second. It yeah. at least shows up. It works. Um, yeah. Oh, no, we're going to also invent our own feed. And and nobody has been coppicing mangroves as far as we know. No, um, only that, we that have. Seems, that seems, yeah, adding complexity. And, and I can imagine people get scared. Yeah. So that's why in your motto, you just say six years of, of buying feed and that's let's not right. tell anybody. Yeah. That's right. But here's, here's the thing. This is the equivalent of grass-fed beef. Basically. Right? Our shrimp are eating stuff that grows in the ocean that we can grow with the wastewater off of the aquaculture. Okay? So let's, let's do a comparison here. In our seawater ag, we're going to take it from the seawater ag perspective now, rather than the aquaculture perspective. Because we're irrigating with seawater, we never have to worry about weeds. Weeds are not an issue in our farm. Mm -hmm. Because weeds don't grow in seawater, only our crops do. Um, Our crops have, mangroves don't have known pests. Right, there isn't any kind of boll weevil that's ravaging all the mangrove forests on the planet. 
um, in part because of the compounds in, in the wood and the leaves, but also because they're just super saline. Mm -hmm. We don't have weeds. We don't have to buy any fertilizers because that's, that's our aquaculture wastewater. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the feed processed by the shrimp, basically. We only yeah. have to plant once. And you can coppice right? for... And then we can coppice for, for probably 100 years before we have to plant again. All right. The only operation cost to that is harvesting the trees, which we can do mechanically, and separating the wood from the leaves. All right. The photosynthesis is free. The fertilizer is free. We're already pumping the water for the aquaculture. We don't have weeds. And so you compare that to a typical ag system, our costs are going to be way lower. Mm -hmm. And what do you grow in terms of crops on the farm? We've done salicornia, sarcocornia, mm -hmm. disticlus, um, disticlus only experimentally. We haven't done disticlus at large scale. And and what's the markets for? What what do the markets look like for? Like, let's say salty, salt water grown crops. I, I haven't. I, I just don't know. Like, what's? It's the... not that the crops have a market. So in. Um, one of the big markets we can play in there is animal fodder. Mm -hmm. um, Mercy Corps did studies on some of these crops and has said just raw, they can replace 30% of a ruminant's diet. And so do you need, do you have offtake agreements for that? Do you need that? Yes. Is that? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. We've well? got offtakes on it. Okay. Because during the summer, the sheep and goat and cattle grazers in Mexico are buying alfalfa at a thousand dollars a ton. And if you can replace that with something, yeah. Uh, and we can, we can replace that easily. Not only can we replace it easily, we have an infinite source of water. Yeah. For your system. We don't care if it ever rains. That's true. It, it is a hundred percent drought maybe. proof. Yeah. Cause we're irrigating with seawater. Right. And so you go to places like the Middle East where they import 95% of all their fodder and have all kinds of, you know, barren or Issues. desert <laughs> coastland. A lot um, of coastland, a lot of water uh, in very salty form. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of sun, right? So there's, there's huge opportunities in the Middle East with, with the focus on the animal fodder because then it's food security. Mm-hmm. Right. In addition to all the all the environmental benefits, and, and, and to ask the obvious question, why hasn't it happened before yet? If you say my partners have done this twenty years ago in in yeah. East Africa, I mean, people yeah. might have taken notice. Like, what's what's what? Why twenty twenty three and there's, not twenty twenty or twenty two thousand? Yeah. So um, Eritrea ended quite poorly. Um, Shortly after that system became profitable, uh, my the people who designed and ran it were essentially kicked off, and it was nationalized by the Eritrean Navy. Uh, presumably, the, the Eritrean Navy thought it was going to be a cash cow for them. Mm -hmm. um, so in one sense, they were too successful for their own good. Mm -hmm. uh, but... On the other hand, that's also an indicator of success because a yeah. navy, they're not going to seize it if they don't think it's not going to make them money. But at least uh, we don't, we, this hasn't run for the last decade, so we can look no, at it, it compare, it ceased, learn yeah, it, immediately. The whole thing stopped running, you know, within a month or two of them being evicted. Um, but that was the first commercial large scale version. The, after that, the folks who are now my partners went to Egypt and they spent two and a half years in the pre-development of a very large project in Egypt um, that was called the New Nile Project. And this one, uh, they had a plan for 100,000 hectares. Wow. And in the business model they had, their, their primary market was going to be sustainable aviation fuels, um, which, which was we a boom can at grow. some point. Yeah, there was a boom at some point, but also yeah. it, it drizzled um, away. <laughs> they got the land. They got, you know, local academic partners with um, AUC. And in my understanding is in December of 2010, Hosni Mubarak approved the project. 
Uh, and then three months later, the Arab Spring happened. So that was the end. Right? Yeah. So there was a... Uh, Timing is everything. Yeah. yeah so so it, Mubarak's projects all got shelved. Um, I met these folks through Stanford in, 29, in 2018. Mm -hmm. I grokked the concept um, because I'd always been up in the mountains thinking like, what do you do on the beach? Right? Like, I know how to do yeah. stuff in the watersheds and how to manage the water up there. But what do you do on the beach? And these guys were the answer to that question. And so it, when I met them and I understood the concept and started to grasp the potential, I said, okay, will you take me along? I want to work with you guys on this. And then they asked me to be the CEO. Uh, but my partners have been working on this for 30 years. Now, so that's some of the answer to why this isn't already happening everywhere is that it's a new industry. And it needs the right puzzle pieces at the right time. And it needs the right puzzle pieces. Another part, though, is uh, pumping technology is actually a lot better than it was 20 years ago. Uh, why is that? Because of fracking? What's I don't know why. <laughs> but but That's when I look at their projected costs for pumping and, and what we can do now, it's a lot lower. And we pump a lot of water. And right. so, you need, and the energy cost for that probably and the energy of cost solar prices that, right? have so gone a lot. Solar is better. a lot further along. Pumping's a lot further along. So the the barrier to entry is on the capex are are significantly lower. Interesting. The other thing is carbon markets are much more developed. True. There's a much greater recognition of the need to invest in nature. We're starting Hence to your produce. half a million mangrove trees this year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's starting, there's starting to be wider recognition of, of, you know, the value of biodiversity and how much we rely on it. Um, so I think markets have improved. Costs for implementing these kinds of projects have gone down. And there's a wider recognition now that this kind of thing is necessary. Uh, so... Sounds like the perfect storm or the perfect, well, the perfect puzzle pieces are starting to align. It's slowly. starting to yeah. align. It's starting to align. I think Carl Hodges, who was the scientist who, who was the brain behind all of mm -hmm. this stuff, he was so far ahead of his time. Um, we haven't talked about Carl. Carl is um, one of the pioneers of controlled environment agriculture. He was one of the first mm -hmm. people to do uh, controlled ag and greenhouses in the Middle East. He was also the father of the shrimp aquaculture industry. He was the first mm -hmm. one to figure out how to replicate the life cycle of shrimp in, in a facility. Um, and that was back in the 1960s. He, he was with the University of Arizona. So he, he was a pioneer in greenhouse ag, shrimp aquaculture. And after he did the shrimp aquaculture, he said, we got all this waste. What are we going to do with it? So he had this whole concept back in the early 1970s, right? Like 50 years ago. And it took him 30 years to be able to do like a commercial scale prototype in Eritrea. Right? Of Which all was, places. Yeah. That ran from 1999 to 2004, but it took him 30 years to get there. And they did prototypes on different aspects of it. They were breeding halophytic crops. They were, you know, working with different salinity levels they were trying to figure out how it all works so there's there's 50 years of work underpinning this and two of my partners have, were involved in you know 30 35 years of that um yeah and there's a danger then always with people that have been in that for so long and have seen it's possible to just miss the i'm not saying the connection but always almost the story connection with people that just come into uh, mangroves yeah. are important and circularity is important because you might sound just way too far ahead of your time even now and and lose the connection with the rest of the world that's sort of catching up with okay we can restore and we can go from an incredible degraded piece of land which is cheap and like have a functioning ecosystem and economy on top of it o already those concepts like, yeah we've been doing that for 30 years like it it's very difficult to come down your story mountain and go to like yep. the first base and say okay yep. let's start here 
And that's probably where a lot of these things, unfortunately, end because or don't make any progress because they're just too far apart. They're just too extreme or too um, like we cannot even imagine it's possible, which is yeah. which is an issue, but it's certainly the case. Which is why it's good to say we've already done it. Yeah, and we've got this, and we've got the garage system running. Uh, you can see it. You can taste right? the shrimp. People you can, can go and visit. Yeah. They can come eat some salad cornea. They can have some shrimp, and then we can take them to the sites and say, "This place." Imagine has- ten times. Imagine a yeah. hundred times. Yeah, like that's yeah, what yeah. people can if they see it. Yeah, some VR glasses so you can see how it could look like, and and then uh, you you because I think that's what we miss: imagination to. Imagine, because we we're so used, and every generation is so used to their degraded landscape. Like we see it going down a bit, and think, okay, like this, what is it, the baseline syndrome, and, yeah. and we just cannot imagine how it would, how abundant it could be, and and that's probably holding us back to put money to work and to put, to put our time in it and our efforts. Like, Maybe. how would you imagine like a degraded coastline that like we described in the first interview and now as well? Like, nothing seems to be growing there, and how can you imagine that looks like? an abundant piece yeah. of land that just produce way more than you can ever even imagine to consume. We, like we're always used we to this. make it rival conventional farmland. On, on sand, basically. Let's, let's call yeah. it like it is. Yeah. yeah Which yeah, is, yeah. but that concept is just so impossible to like, we can more easily imagine we can grow something on Mars than that, I think, because it's Mars doesn't it's, have seawater. No. So, but just for the concept, like it's, it's, <laughs> It's very interesting how imagination works. Anyway, we can talk about this this for for many hours, yeah. but I also want to be conscious of your time and thank you so much for a very very um, thoughtful and fruitful uh, check in interview. And I hope the next few months uh, will uh, be let's say not more productive, more not so more effective, but let's say lead to more investments flowing in uh, than the last six months have we'll with all it. the lessons you've learned. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm, I'm not someone will buy it. We're going to make that someone a whole lot of money. Um, and then and then that'll bring the other folks in. And it's always, it's that first one that, that yeah, dares to step uh, outside. What is it? The flock of sheep. And then the rest will follow. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Thank you so much for, for your time and the work you do and for coming on here a second time to, to share about it. My pleasure, Colin. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you liked this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.